Hi everyone, I'm back again with a bit more information about these Armenian royalty and uh, the Khazarian Gog Magog followers and I just uh, have a few connections here related to Revelation 20 and it says, and I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Now, I've had a few people commenting about Satan being a spiritual being in heaven, and they find it hard to get their head around that the dragon is actually a bloodline, a people, and still consider Satan to be a spiritual being in heaven or that was cast out of heaven. It's a spiritual person. Or a spiritual entity but you know there's plenty of scripture to show that there is a serpent seed it's a bloodline it's a group of people so we've got the seed of the woman it's in genesis and the seed of the serpent what that means exactly i'm not sure like was the serpent referencing another group of people that weren't from adam i don't know but at the time of Jesus, we have Jesus calling the Pharisees uh, children of their father, the devil, the serpent. He's calling them the serpent seed. And there seems to be something that goes along with the Canaanites and that whole group. Now, in Malachi, we have Esau's inheritance going to the dragons of the wilderness. And we know historically that Esau married into the Canaanite lines. He married the children of Ishmael. And basically the people of that region became what we know today as Arabs, which the word Arab basically means mixture. We have in Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar worshipping Marduk the dragon. The people of Nebuchadnezzar, the, the reign of Nebuchadnezzar was from the people that worshipped Nabu and they were the first kings to take rule of Babylon from the Assyrians and basically they were a nomadic people. Then we have Helena Blavatsky talking about the Nabataeans of Iraq and they were a nomadic people that lived on the outskirts of the city. The Nabataeans of Iraq were nomads. They lived in tents. We have the spice trading route coming from the Negev all the way up to Babylon and all throughout the ancient world. The traveling nomadic people, the merchants. And then we have the Nabataeans of the Negev. And now the historians are telling us that there's absolutely no connection between the Nabataeans of Iraq and the Negev, which there's a direct trading route from Babylon and Iraq all the way down to Nabatea. So basically the Nabataeans of the Negev intermingle with the Idumeans or the Edomites of this region and they become trading partners on the Spice and Silk Road. And it's during the Babylonian captivity of the southern kingdom of Judea that the Edomites betray the Israelites so that they can steal their trading royalties basically the Edomites married the Canaanites they married the Ishmaelites they all mixed together in this region and as I said we have the Arabs who are the word Arab meaning mixture Arabs who are nomadic they're traders they're very famous for their ships and trading you know the Arabian Nights and all those kind of tales we have King Herod, who is the son of Nabataean royalty and Edomite royalty. His father was an Edomite, his mother was a Nabataean. And, you know, if we look at this historically and we follow these links, we can pretty much guess that Herod's ancestry goes back to the royalty and aristocracy of Babylon through these Chaldean lines through Babylon and Nabataea. So we have Esau's 
inheritance being left in Malachi to the dragons of the wilderness. And we have the people of the wilderness, the traveling merchants, the nomadic people. And so I think that the Bible is showing us that this dragon, this dragon line, where it's from, where it goes. And in the last days, we have this dragon returning again. So at the time of the Roman wars with Judea, the fall of Jerusalem, we have this dragon serpent line on the throne of Israel and we have their people in the temple teaching the Babylonian Talmud, Talmudic rules. And this is who Jesus was arguing with. And let's not forget John the Baptist as well, who lost his head to the Herods, Herod Antipas and his incestuous wife Herodias, then her daughter Salome. But not only were they on the throne of Judea, they were also ruling as Roman consuls throughout the Roman Empire. So I believe that the original little horn in this Roman beast was Herod as king of Judea. The Herodian political party and also the Idumean priesthood that was in the temple. But these Herods also ruled in Armenia Lesser, in Cilicia, which is uh, part of Turkey, Pergamon, uh, among other places. And we see Salome and her husband Aristobulus ruling in Lesser Armenia. Basically, their children, they had three sons recorded in history and what seems to be daughter as well, that just disappear off the face of history. And I believe that they didn't disappear. I think they became the Armenian royal family. The Armenian royal family claim to be a direct link to the throne of David. And the Herod family claimed this also through Herod's marriage to the Hasmonean princess Mariamne. So Salome and her husband both claimed that they had the right to choose the high priest of the temple and that they were part of the Judean royal family and that they were linked to the throne of David. When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Now, if we stop looking at Satan as being, or the dragon as being a spiritual being, and we look at them as being a people or a royal family, we can see that here in the scripture, Revelation 20, that the dragon is still part of the nations. It just has no power over the, to deceive them. It has no power to deceive them. Shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. Now, who are in the four quarters of the earth at this time? We have this Khazarian conversion to Judaism. And basically, when the Khazarian Empire was destroyed by the, the Russians, they spread out into the nations of Europe. We have them known as the Wandering Jew. They were the merchants of the Silk Road. And they traveled these uh, merchant highways, basically. And they went into all the nations and they controlled the merchant system. They controlled banking. Now, this Khazarian conversion happened around 700 AD. But something happened a lot earlier than that to different people, who I believe were the people that converted these Khazarians. And that was the Edomite Herodian Idumeans from Judea. And when Rome fell, they lost their political power. So the Sanhedrin had to move out of Jerusalem. I believe it moved north to Syria, a region in Syria. Where it moved to from there, I'm not sure later on in history, but basically all of these Edomite Jews were pushed out into the nations of the world. Now these Egyptian converts had a taste for the high life and they liked to be in the high places and in positions of power. So there was no way they were going to go back and make a homeland for themselves in the desert of the Negev where there was basically nothing. And now that Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Romans and the wars that happened there, 
not to mention what I believe is the judgment of God on this region through earthquakes. I've spoke about this in other videos, all of the uh, geological events that were happening in the Levant or the Judean region at the time. So this group of people that called themselves Jews went out to the most wealthy and powerful cities of the nations of the earth, Rome and Athens. Another place they went to was Alexandria in Egypt and Carthage. All of the new cities being created in Europe, France and Germany on these trading routes and they became the religious and merchant elite of what we know today as the Roman Catholic Church and the whole Holy Roman Empire system. Now they control our nations. So this dragon, which is an entity that still is existing, but it doesn't have the power to deceive the, the nations. And the reason it can't deceive the nations is because the nations are Christian. It gathers these Magog people together to battle against the saints. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about the beloved city and fire came down for God out of heaven and devoured them. This hasn't happened yet. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, I don't know why anyone can't see this in this scripture. The devil was cast into the lake of fire with the beast. Now, we know the beast is a political system and the false prophet. We're all looking for this man who's a false prophet. So, you know, we've got the devil, which is supposed to be this spiritual being. And now we're separating him from the beast, which is a political system. We know that the political systems are royal families, even the the uh, presidents, all the presidents of America have been part of this royal family. They're an aristocratic line. The beasts of this world are an aristocratic families ruling over us. False families. They're not even our brother, as Samuel says, that if we're to have a king over us, he should be our brother, not some false family of people over us. And a false prophet so a lying, deceiving man, a false prophet, pretending to be the Messiah. So if we have a look at Muhammad, he's a false prophet. He is part of these Nabataean royal family lines. And he declares that he went to heaven from the Temple Mount, riding a horse called Barak or lightning, and he returned from heaven riding on lightning, riding this horse called lightning, just as Satan fell from heaven like lightning. Uh, we have got real people here, real family lines and real aristocratic rulers and controllers that are over the people and the saints, just as we had in Judea at the time of Jesus. So this dragon entity, this dragon family, serpent seed, controls Gog and Magog. Now I've shown in my other videos that Gog and Magog are the sons of Japheth, the, the Japheth Japhetic line. And they are the Khazarian people of what today is the area of Ukraine. And the irony is, is that now we have Zelensky and Netanyahu and they're creating this war, these two wars that we're having right now and trying to unite the Ukraine and Israel as big Israel. And what I believe is to be the new Silk Road, the resurrection of the old Silk Road system the new world order with a new world order digital economy. So I'm going to read some information about the Khazarian people and who I believe converted them to Talmudic Judaism. It is even possible that my ancestry might not move in the direction of ancient Israel at all. After 965, the Khazars were through as an organized power, but Judaism may have remained. And it may well be that many East European Jews are descended from Khazars and the people they rule. I may be one of them. Who knows and who cares? Isaac Asimov, it's been a good life, 2002. So this is from the book The Invention of the Jewish People by Shlomo Sand. It goes on to say Shlomo Sand argues that most Jews actually descend from converts whose 
Native lands were scattered far across the Middle East and Eastern Europe. The formation of a Jewish people and then a Jewish nation out of these desperate groups could only take place under the sway of a new historiography developing in response to the rise of nationalism throughout Europe. Beneath the biblical backfill of the 19th century historians and the 20th century intellectuals who replaced rabbis as the architects of Jewish identity, the invention of the Jewish people uncovers a new narrative of Israel's formation and proposes a bold analysis of nationalism that accounts for the old myths. Out of these disparate groups could only take place under the sway of the new historiography. So Jewish Kargans, a strange empire rises in the east. In the middle of the 10th century, the Sephardic Golden Age, Hasdi ibn Shaprut, a physician and important statesman in the court of the Caliph of Cordoba, Abd ar-Rahman III, wrote a letter to the king of the Khazars, Joseph. Ben Aaron, rumours about a great Jewish empire bordering on Eastern Europe had reached the Jewish elites at the continent's western end and aroused intense curiosity. Was there at long last a Jewish kingdom that was not subordinate to Muslim or Christian powers? Now remember, if it's the Sephardic Golden Age, we know that from Paul Wexler's book, The Non-Jewish Origins of Sephardic Jews, that the Sephardic Jews originated from the Arabs. Their linguistics and uh, their culture is all tied back to Arabic. So they're not Israelites. So in the West, we have these Sephardic Golden Age. Uh, can I rename that? It's an Edomite Golden Age, a Edomite convert of Jews in the West, like say, for example, the Pierre Leone family in Western culture running banking, and they find out about this Jewish kingdom in and around the Black Sea. Who knows, maybe this was an attempt to create a homeland for themselves because they were always complaining that they never had a homeland, which seems really bizarre to me because just because the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, it doesn't mean that the people in the region couldn't still live there. They just had to live under occupation of the Roman Empire. And, you know, that was most of the known world at the time anyway. It was all under Roman occupation. So it's not like the whole nation of the southern kingdom had to flee from Israel and go somewhere else. From what I understand, even at the time of the Crusades, there were still a lot of Jews living in Judea. The Jewish communities hadn't left the region. They simply stayed and kept living there. And a lot of them were killed by the Crusaders in the wars. So, for example, I've spoken in another video about the Crusaders talking about the blood running up to the horses' bridles, which goes along with the prophecy of Revelation. Many from the tribe of Judah living in this area still at the time died in these wars. The problem with it was is that they were no longer able to have a temple and several times even the Roman emperors tried to rebuild the temple but earthquakes came and destroyed the attempts to rebuild the temple. So you've got to ask yourself who was behind the request to rebuild the temple? Was it the pharisaical priest class? Who's behind the attempts to rebuild Israel today and the desire to re-establish the temple system. The letter opens with a poem of praise for the king with an acrostic composed by Menahem ben Saruk, Hasdai's secretary and leading Hebrew poet in the Iberian Peninsula, followed by the writer's introduction of himself. Into Alia, of course, as a descendant of the exiles from Jerusalem. Now, who were these exiles of Jerusalem? Because a lot of the Jews actually stayed in Jerusalem and died. So the exiles from Jerusalem, were they the Edomite converts or real Israelites? And a description of the kingdom in which he lives, then he comes to the point. Merchants have told me that there is a kingdom of Jews called Alkazar 
and I did not believe it because I thought they said this to please and approach me. I was puzzled about it until emissaries arrived from Constantinople with a gift from their king to our king and I asked them about it. They assured me that this was the truth. The kingdom is called al Khazar, and between al Constantinople and their country there was a journey of 15 days by sea but on land there are many nations between us and the name of its king is Joseph. And I, when I heard this, was filled with force and my hands grew strong and my hope intensified. And I bowed and made obeisance to the Lord of heaven. I searched for a faithful emissary to send to your land to find out the truth and to greet my Lord, the king, and his servants, our brother, but it was difficult to do, for the distance is very great. Hasadi goes on to describe in detail all the difficulties entailed in dispatching the letter and finally asks directions of what tribe is the king, what is the system of the monarchy, is it passed from father to son as was done by the ancestors in the Torah, how big is the kingdom, who are its enemies and over whom does it rule, does war take precedence over the Sabbath, what is the country's climate and so forth. Hasdi's curiosity was limitless, for which he apologized courteously. It is not known how long it took before the Khazar king's reply arrived, but in the extent letter, King Joseph answered Hasdi's questions as best he could. He described his origin and the boundaries of his kingdom. And the King Joseph of the Khazars replies, You have asked of what nation and family and tribe we are, Know you that we are of the sons of Japheth and his son Togamah. It is said that in his time my ancestors were but a few, and the Lord granted them strength and boldness, and they fought with many great nations mightier than they were, and with God's help drove them out and inherited their country. Many generations passed until the king rose, whose name was Bulah a wise and God-fearing man who put all his trust in the Lord and removed all the sorcerers and idolaters from the country and lived under the Lord's wing. This king summoned all the ministers and servants and told them all these things. They were content and accepted the king's judgment and entered under the wing of the Shekinah. Then rose a king of his offspring named Obadiah, a righteous and honest man who reformed the kingdom and set the law in the proper order and built synagogues and seminaries and brought in many of the sages of Israel. Now, given that this is around 700 years after the death of Christ, I'm wondering how many sages were left from Israel. Writing in an epic and ornate style, the king describes the conversion to Judaism and lists the reasons that moved his ancestors to prefer the Jewish religion to the other two monotheistic faiths. In a tone sufficed with favorite belief in the Torah and the commandments, he goes on to describe the location of his kingdom, its size, its population, and the power of his enemies and rivals, the Russians and the Ishmaelites. Various literary embellishments of and additions to the old text led some scholars to conclude that these letters, especially the king's reply, were not written in the 10th century AD and might be forgeries or emendations by Muslim authors. There are two versions of Joseph's letter, a long one and a short one, but certain terms in the short version do not belong in the Arabic lexicon, and its original author was not part of the Muslim cultural world. Moreover, the distinctive linguistic use of the Biblical Hebrew reversing connection indicates that Hazdai's letter and the king's reply were not written by one hand. The letter of the Khazar king was probably copied and embellished many times. But its core information seems fairly trustworthy as it accords with contemporary Arab testimonies and so it cannot be dismissed as merely a literary creation. So what they're saying is a lot of the fundamental information here is correct but you know along the way people have added stuff to it. In any event there is evidence from the late 11th century that despite the difficulties of international communications, copies of both letters in several versions were found throughout the Jewish intellectual world. For example, Rabbi Yehuda al Barzaloni, who questioned the accuracy of these copies, commented, We have seen some versions of the letter written by Joseph, the king, son of Aaron, the Khazar priest, to Rabbi 
Hasdai, son of Yitzhak, and did not know if it was true or not. Finally, though, this sharp scholar who detested fables became convinced and he admitted as much. The Khazars proselytized and had proselyte kings. I have heard that all this is written in the books of Ishmaelites who were living then and wrote about it in their books. He therefore copied the letters of King Joseph and quoted a part of it in his own work. It is almost certain that the 12th century rabbi Yehuda Halavai was familiar with the correspondence. He ascribed the conversion of Judaism by the Khazar monarch to the three-sided monotheistic brainstorming session. Its depiction in the opening of his work, the Khazari, is adapted from King Joseph's letter with some changes in style and detail. It should be noted that Rabad Rabbi Abraham ben David, who was several decades younger than Yehuda Halve, and was one of the fathers of Kabbalah in Provence, wrote of Eastern Europe, there were Khazar people who proselytized and their King Joseph sent a letter to the president Rabbi Hazdai, son of Yitzhak ben Shaprut, to tell him that he followed the rabbinate, and so did all his people. He goes on to say that when in Toledo, Toledo, he met Jewish students who told him that they were Khazars and faithful to rabbinic Judaism. Whereas the histories of the Judaized Himyarites and Berbers were all but erased from the general consciousness, it was more difficult to leave blank pages in the case of the Khazars. In the first place, the secular modern public knew about the Khazuri, the theological treaty completed in 1140 AD by Yehuda Halvei, a highly respected figure in Jewish tradition and a canonical one in Zionist culture because of his particular association with the Holy Land. Second, there was a mass of historical evidence about the Khazar kingdom from Arabic, Persian, Byzantine, Russian, Armenian, Hebrew, and even Chinese sources. They all agreed that it was very powerful, and many of the sources also referred to its unexpected conversion to Judaism. I guess the first question that comes to mind for me is, who is converting these Khazar tribes to Judaism? Furthermore, the historical standing of this kingdom and the events that followed its breakup had been echoed in the earliest Jewish historiography in Eastern Europe, which battled with this issue for decades. Even Zionist reconstructors of the past hesitated for a long time to tackle the subject, and few of them attempted to research it with appropriate thoroughness. But the widespread interest in the Khazar kingdom eventually began to shrink and it all but evaporated with the rise of the memory establishment in Israel after some 10 years of its existence. Although the medieval kingdom of the Khazars existed in the distant obscurity and no gifted theologians had praised and immortalized it as the biblical authors had done in their time and place, it is, however, attested by external sources far more varied and abundant than exist about the kingdom of David and Solomon. Jewish Khazaria was, of course, immeasurably bigger than any historical kingdom in the land of Judah. It was also more powerful than Himya of the desert realm of Daya al Kaniya. The story of the Khazars is fascinating. It begins in the 4th century AD when some nomadic tribes accompanied the Huns as they surged westward. It continues with the rise of a great empire in the steeps along the Volga River and the North Caucasus and ends with the Mongol invasion in the 13th century which wiped out all traces of this extraordinary kingdom. The Khazars were a collection of strong Turkic or Hunic Bulgar clans as they began to settle down, mingled with the Scythians who had inhabited these mountains and steeps between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, which was known for a long time as the Khazar Sea. At its peak, the kingdom encompassed an assortment of tribes and linguistic groups, Alans and Bulgars, Magyars and Slavs. The Khazars collected taxes from them all and ruled over a vast landmass, stretching from Kiev in the northwest to the Crimean Peninsula in the south and from the upper Volga to the present day Georgia. From the 6th century on, Persian testimonies followed by Muslim ones shed light on the early stages of the Khazar saga. 
They invaded the Sassanid kingdom and harassed its border's inhabitants. They got as far as the area of the Mosul in today's Iraq. In early 7th century during the reign of the Persian king Khosrow II, a marriage with the Khazar king's daughter sealed an alliance that enabled the Persians to build fortifications in the passes of the Caucasus Mountains. Remains of these fortifications against Khazar invasions can still be seen. Armenian and Byzantine sources reveal that in the following years, the Khazar kingdom formed an alliance with the Eastern Roman Empire in its struggle against the Persians and became a significant factor in the regional balance of power. The 7th century Armenian bishop Sebos wrote in his history of Heraclius, they, Armenian nobles, went to serve the great Kagan, king of the northern lands, at the command of their king, the Kagan. They marched through the Jaw Pass to come to the aid of the king of Greece. So, you know, here we've got these Armenian nobles, which I believe may be Herods. The Kagan, this being the title the ruler of Khazaria, maintained extensive relations with the Byzantine Empire. Again, the Byzantine leaders, Constantine being related to the Herods through this Anisia family, which I want to investigate more, this Roman Anisia bloodline. The future Emperor Justinian II, who had been exiled in the Crimea, escaped at the end of the 7th century to the Khazar Kingdom, where he married a Khazar princess. She was rebaptized as Theodora and would later be a powerful empress. Nor was this the only marital tie between the realms. In the 10th century, the ruler and author Constantine the Seventh, poor Phrygenitus, wrote that Emperor Leo III allied himself by marriage with the Kargin of Khazaria, accepting his daughter as wife for his son Constantine VI, shaming the Byzantine Empire and himself because he thereby abandoned the precepts of the forefathers and treated them with disdain. The non traditional inter dynastic match took place in 732 AD and the son born of it became the emperor who was known as Leo the Khaza. This was also the zenith of the diplomatic relations between the two mighty kingdoms. The Khazars succeeded in the course of many battles to hold to the Muslims' northward sweep and temporarily save the Byzantine Empire from a menacing encirclement that would have precipitated its collapse. The many battles between the Muslims and the Khazars were described by numerous Arab chroniclers who had no qualms about copying each other's work. Ibn al Afdir wrote that they fought very fiercely and both sides held out. The Khazars and the Turks overcame the Muslims. After al Jara fell on the battlefield, the Khazars converted the country and penetrated far into the reach of Mosul. This was in 730 AD, but the response was not long in coming. After a tremendous logistical effort and more battles, the Arab armies managed to repel the determined enemy. The commander who would later be Caliph Marwan II even led strong forces into Khazaria itself and his condition for withdrawal was the conversion of the Khagan to Islam. The Khazar sovereign accepted and the Arab armies retreated to the Caucasus Mountains which was agreed as the final boundary between Khazaria and the Muslim world. As we shall see, the temporary conversion of the pagan Khazar kingdom was not very meaningful though. Many of its Subjects accepted the faith of Muhammad. Most sources depict the Khazar kingdom as having a highly original dual government, a supreme holy leader as well as an active secular leader. Ahmed ibn Fadlan, a diplomat and author who was sent by the Caliph al Muqtadi in 921 AD to the Volga country by the Volga, crossed Khazaria and described it in his rare travel notes. On the Khazars and the political system, he wrote, As for the king of the Khazars, known as Kargan, or Kargan, he is seen only once in four months and at a respectful distance. He is called the great Kargan, and his duty is called Kargan Bey. It is the latter who commands the armies, administers the kingdom, and looks after it. He sallies and raids, and the kings of the vicinity surrender to him. He goes every day to see the great Kargan in the deferential manner showing himself humble and modest. More information is found in the work of the geographer and chronicler Al 
Estark rewriting in about 932. His description is livelier and more picturesque. As for their regime and government, their master is called the Karkin Kaza, who is more exalted than the king of the Kazas, though it is the king who empowers him. When they want to empower a Karkin, they throttle him with a silk cord, and when he has almost suffocated, they ask him, For how long do you wish to reign? And he replies, So many years. If he dies before that time, it is well. Otherwise, he is put to death at that time. Well, that's kind of interesting tie in there with Freemasonry and wearing silk ties around the neck and the whole hangman card. Only the son of well-known families may fill the post of Karkin, and he has no real power, but is worshipped and adored when people appear before him. Yet no one enters his presence except a small number such as the king and those of his rank. And no one is appointed Karkin except those who cleave to Judaism. Well, maybe that's an insight of to how the politics of this world actually work. Other Arabic sources corroborate the existence of a dual power system in Khazaria. This was an efficient regime. It maintained a mystique around the great Kargan and utilized the most gifted and competent prince as the Bey, who functioned as a military viceroy. The halo of sanctity that hang over the Kagan did not stop him from maintaining a harem of 25 women and 60 concubines, though this was not necessarily in devout emulation of the biblical king Solomon. The seat of the rulers was the capital Itil, beside the Volga estuary on the Caspian Sea. Unfortunately, it appears that the changes in the course of the great rivers, tributaries and the rise of the sea level inundated the city, whose precise location remains unknown. In the kingdom maintained a documentary archive. It was lost and scholars have had to rely mainly on external sources. Itil was largely a city of tents and wooden houses and only the ruler's residences were built of brick. Ibn Fadlan's description provides some details. So we know that the Khazars were typically rice growers and regular consumers of fish and wine. Though the bulk of the kingdom's income came from tolls, Khazaria straddled the Silk Road and also dominated the Volga and the Don Rivers, which were major transportation routes. A further source of income was the heavy tax imposed on the numerous tribes governed by the kingdom. The Khazars were known for their flourishing trade, especially in furs and slaves and their growing wealth enabled them to maintain a strong and well-trained military force that dominated all of southern Russia and today's eastern Ukraine. So, you know, here we've got the Ukraine, and they want to unite Ukraine with Israel, big Israel. Thus far, the descriptions of the Arab chroniclers coincide and even accord with the testimony of King Joseph's letter. The question of the Khazar language, however, is obscure. No doubt the great mixture of tribes and populations spoke various languages and dialects. But what was the language of the Khazar power elite? Al-Ishtakri followed Al-Bakri wrote, The language of the Khazars differs from that of the Turks and the Persians' language and does not resemble the language of any other nation. Nevertheless, most researchers assume that the spoken Khazar language consisted of Hunic Bulgarian dialects with others from the Turkic family. There is no doubt, however, that the Khazars' sacred tongue and written communication was Hebrew. The few extant Khazar documents indicate as much, and the Arab writer Al-Nadim, who lived in Baghdad in the 10th century, confirms it. As for the Turks and the Khazars, they have no script of their own, and the Khazars write in Hebrew. Inscriptions have been found in Crimea that are in the non-Semitic language written in Hebrew characters. Two of these characters, Shin and Zadik, eventually entered the Cyrillic alphabet, presumably in the course of the Khazars' early rule over the Russians. Why did the Khazar kingdom not adopt the Greek or Arabic language for religious usage and high-level communication? Why did the Khazars become Jews when all their neighbours converted en masse either to Christianity or to Islam? And another question, when did the amazing collective proselytization begin? Khazars and Judaism, a long love affair. 
One of the few surviving testimonies left by the Khazars themselves is the important document known to scholars as the Cambridge Document. Its originality is less disputed than that of King Joseph's letter. The Hebrew manuscript written by Jewish Khazar from the court of King Joseph was found in the famous Cairo Geniza, published in 1912, and has since been kept at the Cambridge University Library. Little is known about the writer or the addressees, but it appears to have been written in the 10th century AD and may have been another reply to Hasadi's request. The text is fragmented and many words are missing, but it's still a rich source of information. After a few missing lines, the letter reads as follows. And this is what's kind of interesting. Armenia and our ancestors fled from them, for they could not bear the yoke of the worshippers of idols. And the princes of Khazaria received them, for the men of Khazaria were first without the Torah, and they too remained without Torah and scriptures, and made marriage with the inhabitants of the land, and mingled with them. And they learned their deeds, and went out with them to the war continually, and they became one people. Only upon the covenant of circumcision they relied, and some of them observed the Sabbath. And there was no king in the land of Khazaria, only him who won victories in the battle. They would appoint over him them as general of the army. Now it happened at one time when the Jews went forth into the battle with them as was their wont, that on the day a Jew proved mighty with the sword and put to flight the enemies who came against Khazaria. Then the people of Khazaria appointed him over them as general of the army in accordance with their ancient custom. So what's it saying here? You know, it says Armenia and our ancestors fled from them for they could not bear the yoke and worship of idols and the princes of Khazaria received them. So I'm just going to go to the uh, Jewish virtual library now and it says about Armenia in Transcaucasia. Historically, its boundaries embraced a much wider area in different periods. The Armenian diaspora is scattered in many countries of the world and still identifies its past history and future aspirations with the wider connotations of the term Armenia. Jewish historical, exegetical and descriptive sources reveal knowledge of the variations in geographical area and history of the remarkable people. The fate and modes of existence of the Armenians have been compared in some essential features to those of the Jews. Much of the original Armenia is now the area of Kurdistan in Turkey. However, from the 7th to 9th centuries, the Arab conquerors called by the name Armenia a province which included entire Transcorsica with the cities Bada, now Bada, and the present Azerbaijan, where the governors mostly resided and Tiflis, now Tbilis, capital of Georgia. The province is also sometimes called Armenia in eastern sources. The Khazars were sometimes credited with Armenian origin. This is stated by the 7th century Armenian bishop and historian Sebots. So we're talking 700 years after Christ, after the time of the Herods in Judea, that this bishop is crediting the origin of the Khazars from the Armenians. And the Arab geographer Damascui, 1327, in the 13th to 14th centuries, the Crimea and the area to the east were known as Gazaria or Khazaria to Western authors and as maritime Armenia to Armenian authors. The term Armenia often includes much of Anatolia or otherwise referred to cities on the Syrian Mesopotamian route, now Turkey, near the Syrian frontier, such as Haran, Edessa and Nisibis. In the past, Armenia has been connected with the biblical Ashkenaz. The Armenians are termed the Ashkenazi nation in the literature. According to the tradition, the genealogy in Genesis 10.3 attended to the populations west of the Volga. The Jewish usage Ashkenaz is sometimes equated with Armenia. In addition, it sometimes covers neighboring Adabani, and also Khazaria. The Crimea and the area to the east, the Sakwiliba, i.e. the territory of the Slavs and neighbouring forest tribes, considered by the Arab dependent of Khazaria, as well as eastern and central Europe and northern Asia. 
In other expositions found in rabbinical works, Armenia is linked with Uz. The anti-Jewish attitudes prevailing in eastern Byzantine Armenian provinces made the Targum identify it as the daughter of Edom that dwellest in the land of Uz or with Constantia in the land of Armenia. Viranashur between Urfa and Nazabin, hence Job's land of Uz, is referred to as Armenia in some commentaries. For instance, in those Namanides and Joseph B. David ibn Yahya, the Uz Armenia of Abraham Feroso is, however, the Anatolian region near Constantinople. Armenia is also sometimes called Amalek in some sources, and Jews often refer to Armenians as Amalekites. This is the Byzantine term for Armenians. It was adopted by the Jews from the Josipon Chronicle, 10th century. According to Josipon, Amalek was conquered by Benjamite noblemen under Saul, and Benjamites are already assumed to be the founders of the Armenian Jewry in the time of Judges. Benjamite origins are claimed by the sectarian Kurds. The idea that Khazaria was originally Amalek helped to support the assumption that the Khazar Jews are descended from Simeon. It says here, Armenia has further been identified with biblical Togoma. In Armenian tradition, this genealogy has competed with the theory of Ashkenazi origins and extended to the Scythians east of the Volga. The identification of Armenia as Aram is adopted by Sardia Gaon and also occurs in Islamic literature. In the biblical age, Armenia was conceived as the mountainous expanse in the north, dominating the route from Erez, Israel to Mesopotamia and extending to and beyond the boundaries of the known world. The Forstead Heights near the source of the Euphrates and the Tigris stimulated Jewish commenters to the geographical concepts concerning this area. So Armenia in legend as the Jewish country. Armenia figures prominently in tales from the medieval and early modern periods about the existence of autonomous settlements of free Jews, the kingdom of the legendary Christian Eastern Emperor Prester John, who was the overlord or neighbour of the Jewish land, is sometimes placed near Armenia. The 14th century Ethiopic historical compendium Kebra Negas states that Ethiopia will assist Rome, Byzantium, in liquidating the rebel Jewish state in Armenia. The 14th century travels uh, of Sir John Mandeville, a geographical compilation, states that the Caspian Jews the future Gog and Magog are tributaries to the Queen of Armony, Tamara of Georgia. And that's 1184 to 1212. The Armenian diaspora is the closest historical parallel to the Jewish diaspora and a comparison of the two reveals much in common. This document also describes a tripartite brainstorming encounter between a Muslim, a Christian and a Jew, similar in essential to the description in King Joseph's letter and concluded, of course, with the appropriate decision in favour of Judaism. It seems that this literary historical model was very popular in that period because early Russian chroniclers described the conversion of Vladimir I of Kiev to Christianity in about the same manner, though naturally with a different outcome. A contemporary Arab writer also described the Judaization of the king of Khazaria following an intense theological debate except that in his text the Jewish scholar hired an assassin to poison the Muslim scholar before the decisive confrontation and in that way the Jew turned the king to his religion and converted him. The rest of the so-called Cambridge document, like its opening, suggests an interesting hypothesis concerning the Judaization of the Khazars. Israel, together with the men of Khazaria, returned in perfect repentance, but also the Jews began to come from Baghdad, from Khorasan and from the land of Greece and strengthened the hands of the men of the land and encouraged themselves in the covenant of the father of the multitude, Abraham. And the men of the land appointed over them one of the wise men as judge and they called his name in the tongue of the Khazarians, Kargit. Therefore the judges who arose after him are called by the name Kagan, even unto this day. As to the great prince of Khazaria, 
they turned his name into Sabriel and thus made him king over them. It may be that this Sabriel was the post-conversion name of King Bulan mentioned in Joseph's letter and this story may well be unreliable and the dramatic description of the Judaization merely fables and sermons. However, stories about migration as the catalyst in the process of proselytization seem much more relevant to understanding Khazar history. The arrival of Jewish believers from Armenia, from today's Iraq and from Khorasan, which covered most parts of modern-day Iran, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan and Pakistan, and from Byzantium may well have triggered the conversion of the strange kingdom to Judaism. Proselytizing Jews were driven from the arena of rival monotheism, Christianity or Islam to the lands of paganism. We've got here that the Jews are proselytizing the Khazarians. But, you know, we know from Revelation that it's the dragon that brings Gog Magog against the saints. We know that the saints are the Israelite people. And so, therefore, uh, we know that the Khazars are Gog Magog. So, if this group of people were converted to the religion of the Jews. We know that these Jews were not Israelites. They were of the dragon people, the Edomite converts from Judaism that fled from Judea during the Roman War. The idea that they were from Armenia and from Persia, these particular Babylonian Jews, Talmudic Jews were in these centers of the merchant world in these days. So I'm just trying to point out here that there are two separate versions of Jews today. We have the dragon Jews or the Edomite Jews and we have the Khazarian Gog Magog converts back around the 900s, 7 to 900 AD. So this dragon was in the earth, it was, in the, it was the merchants, it was in the nations, the, the uh, leading, controlling nations, Byzantium, in this time. And at some point it's, it's uh, converted the Khazarians to, or Gog Magog to their Talmudic religion. And then basically it's been chained for a thousand years or it's bound from deceiving the nations. So I just want to add in a little reminder here about the city of Jerusalem and during uh, modern days it's been divided into four quarters and number one we have the Jewish quarter so we can pretty much say that's the Khazarian quarter, the Muslim quarter so the Arab quarter, the Christian quarter which we know is simply just Roman Catholic and the Armenian quarter. So according to Wikipedia, the old city of Jerusalem is today divided into four uneven quarters. In a tradition which may have begun in an 1840s British map of the city, these are the Muslim quarter, the Christian quarter, the Armenian quarter and the Jewish quarter. And as I've said, the Roman Catholic quarter, uh, none of these belong to true Israelite people or the true faith of Jesus and Christianity. All of these quarters are basically of Babylonian faiths. So a fifth area, the Temple Mount known to Muslims as Al-Aqsa or Haram al-Sharif is home to the Dome of the Rock. So we do have a an Edomite temple on the Temple Mount today. The old city's current walls and city gates were built by the Ottoman Empire from 1535 to 1542 under Suleiman the Magnificent. The old city is home to several sites of key importance and holiness to the three major Abrahamic religions. Ironically, we have these Armenians that are linked to the Khazarian conversion. In my last video, I pointed out about how the Herod family were ruling in the Armenian region. My, I mean, Alessa, uh, Salome and Aristobulus and, and her children and Babylonian Jews, the Chaldean priesthood, uh, linking back to Herod again through the Nabataean people and royal lines.
And even the Habsburgs back in the day claimed that they were descendants from this Anissia family. So in this period of time, the Habsburgs were claiming relation to the Anissia family of Rome via being descendants of the Pierre Leone Jewish banking family. And they sang later historically that it was them just clutching at sort of some ancient um, genealogical or that they weren't actually related to them. But I, I kind of think that maybe they realised, hey, let's let's not let people know that we are related to this family. Let's hide it. I don't know. Tell me what you think about this. I believe we're in the little season. I believe that the dragon bankers from the Western Roman Empire, like the Pierre Leone family, who are still around today, uh, who became the Venetian and Genoan bankers and the banking families through there. We don't know which families are actually descended from them. A lot of them claim relation to this Anisi Anisia family from ancient Rome, which I've shown a link to Herod's. So why am I searching the racial backgrounds of these people? Well, in an upcoming video, I want to do some more research into the Scythians. A lot of people say the Scythians were Israelites. I'm not sure of this. I'm convinced that the Sumerians are and were uh, the Gemeri who went through to be the the uh, Gallic or Celtic people. But some people say that the Scythians were Khazarians. In this article from the Jewish Encyclopedia, they're saying that the Khazarians are most likely to be Armenians or Turkic. So were the Scythians Turkic? Uh, I'm just a quick Google here. It says there is no consensus. There is no consensus of whether the Scythians were Turkic or not. Some researchers consider them to be proto-Turkic, while others believe that they have no relation to the Turkic languages. There are people in Turkey and other Altic-speaking countries who believe that the Scythians were not actually Iranic, but a Turkic Mongolic people. The basis of these claims generally lie in similarities of culture, tradition, profession, skills, and so on. So I'm going to look into this later on, but you know, this is a really important question because a lot of this uh, European Israel argument is based on the Scythian people being lost tribes of Israel. Now, according to history, the Scythian people were Japhetic. They're Japhetic tribes up on the steeps. So, you know, if that's true, that wipes out this claim that the Scottish and the Viking people were actually lost tribes of Israel. So that's something I'm going to research later, but it may appear now that um, the Khazarian people did not come from the Scythian people, which is a, a tick for the pro side for the Scythians being tribes of Israel, because we know that Khazaria is Gog Magog. And if they come from the Scythians, there's no way that the Scythians could be the lost tribes of Israel. So the origin of the Armenians is a topic concerned with the emergence of the Armenian people and the country called Armenia. The earliest universally accepted reference to the people and the country dates back to the 6th century BC. The Histon inscription followed by several Greek fragments and books. The earliest known reference to geopolitical entity where Armenians originated from is dated to the 13th century BC as Uratri in Old Assyrian. Historians and armenologists have speculated about the earlier origin of Armenian people, but no consensus has been achieved as of yet. Genetic studies show that Armenian people are indigenous to historical Armenia, showing little to no sign of admixture since around the 13th century BC. Recent studies have shown that Armenians are indigenous to the Armenian highlands and form a distinct genetic isolate in the region. There are signs of considerable genetic admixture in Armenians between 3000 BC and 2000 BC, but they subside to insignificant levels since 12,000 BC remaining stable until today. Now, this is a really interesting date regarding what I was speaking about before with the Scythians and the tribe of Dan. So it says the study shows that modern Armenians have the lowest genetic distance between the ancient individuals in this data set, followed 
closely by Georgians compared to other populations such as Turks, Persians and Azerbaijanis. So what it's saying here is that since ancient times, the Armenians have pretty much stayed in this specific region, which means that Armenian people are more than likely not lost tribes. So my guess is that Japhetic refers to the descendants of Japheth. So in the biblical genealogy, we've got all the sons of Japheth and the grandsons here. Meshech and Tubal is named along with Gog and Magog. Some of the nations that various later writers, including Jerome and Isidore of Seville, as well as other traditional accounts, have attempted to describe the Japhites are listed below. Goma, Scythians, Sumerians, Phrygians, Turks. Now, the Scythians and the Sumerians were both nomadic, so they were kind of passing through. Um, so I, I doubt that they are Japhetic. And I'll go explain that in a later video. Phrygians, Turks, Bulgars, Armenians, including most of the other related peoples in the Caucasus. They're saying Welsh, Picts, Germanic people. Uh, this will be what my video is about. I think it's these people in the region of the uh, Black Sea and the Mediterranean that are Japhetic people. So according to Wikipedia, Ashkenaz in the Hebrew Bible, in the genealogies of the Hebrew Bible, Ashkenaz, Greek, he was the first son of Goma, the brother of Rifeth and Togoma, with Goma being the grandson Noah through Japheth. In Jeremiah 51, 27, the kingdom of Ashkenaz was to be called together with Arat and Minai against Babylon, which reads, Set ye up a standard in the land below the trumpet among the nations. Prepare the nations against her, i.e. Babylon. Call together against her the kingdoms of Arat, Minai, and Ashkenaz. Appoint a captain against her. Cause the horses to come up as the rough caterpillars. According to the Encyclopedia Biblica, Ashkenaz must have been one of the migratory peoples which in the time of Esarhaddon burst upon the northern provinces of Asia Minor and upon Armenia. One branch of this migration appears to have reached Lake Urumea, for in the revolt which Esarhaddon chastised the Manai, who lived to the southwest of the lake, sought the help of Isparki of the land of Ashguza a name originally perhaps as Gunza, which the scepticism of Dilman need not hinder us from identifying with the Ashkenaz and from considering as that of a horde from the north in Indo-Germanic origin which settled on the south of Lake Urumea. So Lake Urumea is an Indoric salt lake in Iran. The lake is located between the provinces of East Azerbaijan and West Azerbaijan in Iran. So it's northern Iran and west and south portion of the Caspian Sea. All right, and the Manai or Mania was an ancient kingdom located in northwestern Iran, south of Lake Urmia, around the 10th and 7th centuries BC. It neighbored Assyria and Urartu, as well as other small buffer states between the two, such as Musaris, M Musasir, and Zikurta. So, you know, according to this and biblical scripture, Ashkenaz was part of the Minai or the Manai who were a Japhetic people and it looks like that uh, the Khazarian people are actually nomadic tribes related to the Armenian people. In this article, Truth is the Journey, it's about Ezekiel 38, who are Meshech, Tubal, Goma, E, Beth, Togoma. So, you know, it's Gog, Magog, chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. So in Ezekiel 38, 1, 3, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, set your face towards Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him, saying, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. It says, Ezekiel 38, 6, Goma and all his hordes, Beth Togomar from the utmost parts of the north, with all his hordes, many people are with you. So the hordes in the north, Magog, was a son of Japheth, we know this. So the Bible and ancient historians point to the fact 
the land of Magog is modern day Russia. I don't really believe this. What about the brothers of Magog? They include Goma, Meshech, and Tubal. Goma means complete. Historians through the ages debate whether they lived north or south of the Black Sea. North of the Black Sea is modern day Russia. South of the Black Sea is modern day Turkey. Meshech means drawing out a people on the borders of Colchis. So this is uh, this Armenian region. The land area east of the Black Sea, Armenia, is effectively modern day Eastern Turkey. Today, the region of Meshek is modern day Turkey, Russia, and Georgia. So, Meshek and Tubal is Georgia, Armenia, this region um, to the east of the Black Sea. Tubal means thou shalt be brought, a region in East Asia Minor, modern day Eastern Turkey. Beth Togama, Beth is a Hebrew for house. Togama means thou will break her. People consider this to be Armenia. At its peak, the Armenian Empire was from modern-day Syria on the Mediterranean Sea to the south of the Black Sea and east to the Caspian Sea. Historically, Turkey is also known as the House of Togama. Now, remember earlier I mentioned that the Sanhedrin, after the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, moved to Syria. It was actually a region of Galilee, which became part of modern-day Syria. Definitions are from Strong's Concordance, historical evidence from Google Images, Wikipedia. The brothers of Magog, Meshek, Goma and Tubal appear to point to modern day Turkey. So this includes Georgia and Armenia uh, because they were part of this ancient Asia Minor and, uh, you know. So I don't really want to include Russia into this equation, but, you know, we know that there's issues at the moment with Ukraine, Russia, Georgia, they're fighting over it. I don't believe in this Russian prophecy so much that they are Gog, Magog who are going to come against Israel because I believe it's more that the people of Gog, Magog are actually in Israel at the moment. But nevertheless, it's showing that Armenia and Georgia are Meshek, Tubal, Gog, Magog. If the Khazarians are Turkic, they come out of the Armenian Turkic people. And as I said, I'm going to look into the origins of the Scythian people. It's looking that the Khazars are not part of the Scythian tribes, in my opinion. But as I said, I'm in two minds about this. And just a side tangent here, I was just thinking that one of the greatest devils of history, Stalin, was actually from the country of Georgia. So. At the end of the day, you know, we can't 100% prove this. There seems to be information linking this and it lines up with revelation and scripture. Why is this important? Because it's important for us to know at what timeline and date we're at. And, you know, we have Ishmael and Isaac, we have Jacob and Esau. And it's always the older sibling that's trying to steal the birthright. And in our case today, we have this Edomite, Khazarian, Dragon, Gog, Magog system that's trying to steal the birthright of Jacob's children and family. And it's coming to an end. It says that when they try to encircle the camp of the saints, it's then that God sends fire from heaven and burns them or devours them and they're cast into the lake of fire or their system is cast into the lake of fire. At the end of the day, you know, we can't 100% prove this. There seems to be information linking this and it lines up with revelation and scripture. Why is this important? Because it's important for us to know at what timeline and date we're at and who exactly is running our world. You know, the Illuminati, the Rothschilds, pointing fingers at, at Khazarians, but there's a bigger picture here. It's an older picture that goes back to the original battle between Jacob and Esau, uh, the blessing always went to the younger son, the seed of the serpent, the seed of the woman. Which one was it? So that's all I have to say today. I'll be back again with some more information on the Scythians. Thanks for listening, everybody. See you next time.